Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Nick on, who is a, an astronomer, a writer. Hi Nick, how are you? I'm not too bad, how are you? Good, good. Um, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you do? Uh, yeah, a bit of a potted history. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> my name's Nick Howes. Uh, I currently work for a large defence company, is probably the best way of describing it. So we do defence research and uh, development and engineering. Um, so the company's called BMT and uh, we employ about 1,500 people uh, in 27 countries around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, predominantly best known for the work we did in the designing of the two most advanced ships afloat at the moment, which are the Queen Elizabeth and Prince Wales aircraft carriers. So wow. we we designed so those. Cool. Yes, <laughs> that was us, um, along with uh, some of the companies in what's called the Aircraft Carrier Alliance. But it was our basically concept idea that ended up with the Twin Island design cool. of the QEC. Yeah, it was. It was very, very neat. And a lot of the work that we did in terms of the deck reinforcements and all sorts. So, um, But the company basically, maritime sector for the best part of its 100 years of existence, uh, formerly as part of the uh, UK Government Defence Maritime Agency, and then in about 1985 spun off into what is now BMT. Um, and then about 10 years ago, they kind of really started branching out into a whole raft of different areas. So right now we do environmental research and development. Um, we do critical infrastructure designs. So we've designed ports all over the world. Um, we have a big cybersecurity team. So we do cybersecurity for the Metropolitan Police in the UK, for the Ministry of Defence. Um, we do it for the National Crime Agency. We've designed drone systems, which uh, use multispectral cameras to hunt for pollutants and chemical spills in dangerous war zones. Um, we do human factors systems. So we do a lot of the human interface design for various defense assets. Um, we still do ship design. So we are working with Harlan and Wolf, famous obviously for their work on the Titanic uh, over 100 years ago. So we're working with them on some of the new Navy destroyers. Uh, we do work in submarine design. Um, we've got, what else do we do? Tons of stuff. It's huge. BMT website, you can just see the, the sheer vastness of the number of projects. And then about two or three years ago I joined well just over two years ago I joined and uh, my boss uh, came over and said you know I was hired initially as a test engineer so testing software for warships etc and he came over and said ah I see you've got a bit of a space background I went yes uh, just a bit Um, and he said do you fancy joining the space team to which I Very said, cool. I didn't even know you had a space team. And he <laughs> yeah. said, well, no, it's a kind of new thing that we're, we're kind of doing. Um, so what BMT have been doing is looking at all the engineering areas that we, we kind of do really well already and thinking, well, we do things like the propellant, propellant fuel management systems um, for the Ministry of Defence for all their missile launches. And that translates really nicely into rocket launches. Um, we do critical infrastructure. So that translates nicely into designing launch platforms. Um, so it all kind of ties in. And we've had approaches from companies who want to launch rockets from ships and all sorts. So uh, that's what I've been doing for the basically the last two years is developing some of the concepts and ideas that uh, we're working on. Um, in terms of transferring those into the space sector. Plus, we have, uh, we're have we an employee benefit trust, so we're kind of like John Lewis. We don't um, have shareholders. Um, all the profits go back into research and development or into the staff, mm-hmm. um, So, uh, which is really nice because it lets us allow, allows us to do a lot of free thinking. So, um, yeah, we've got an innovation and research team, which is kind of what I tie into. And, you know, we're actively encouraged to think up crazy and wacky ideas um, for space systems. So we've got various projects on the go at the moment for anti-GNSS and position navigation and timing spoofing, which ties in really nicely with what the government are doing with OneWeb and various other things like that. Um, projects I'm working on at the moment involves radiation hardening. Um, I've spent the last year securing multiple patents on this um because there's one thing about this industry is that um if you come up with a good idea somebody will try and steal it from you so <laughs> we've we've made sure that we've secured that one yeah um so we're working with one of the big russell group universities that's the other thing we sponsor a lot of phds at universities all over the country um uh, we're strategically aligned with most of the major universities in the uk um so we do projects with imperial college oxford cambridge all those 
Uh, we've got two very specific alliances with Exeter University and Bath University because we're primarily based in Bath. Of the 1,500 staff, there's about 500 based in Bath across three offices. Well, were up until COVID. Mm. Now we're all working from home because we've got an amazing IT team who managed to pull that one off in a matter of days. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, given, I mean, this is the other thing. We, we kind of deal with a lot of um, kind of more secretive stuff, obviously. Mm. Um, so it was a bit complex getting 1500 people who potentially could be working on re relatively sensitive things working from home but then they pulled it off they managed it which was which was really good um, in terms of background why my boss said this so I spent two years working for the European Space Agency um, out of the STEC site at Nordvik or Nordvik uh, in wow. Holland um, uh, working in science and communication on Venus Express, Mars Express, Lisa, Lisa Pathfinder, Herschel um, and a few other projects and that was amazing just That's getting to talk to all the scientists. And already a very impressive CV. <laughs> it was all right and then prior to that uh, well after that no actually prior to that um, I worked on the square kilometre array so it's two years working on pretty much the biggest science project on Earth at the moment, apart from CERN. Mm. Um, the SKA is the big radio telescope based out of Australia and South Africa, uh, where they have literally thousands of telescopes covering frequencies. I think it was, I remember, about 50 megahertz up to 20 kilohertz. Um, uh, sorry, 20 kilohertz. 20, 50 megahertz, 50 kilohertz up to 20 megahertz. That's it. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's just astonishing. These things are generating zettabytes of data per day. Wow. It's 10 times the global internet traffic once it comes online. Um, the 10 times the global internet? Internet, yeah, from a telescope. Oh, shit. Um, and the scary thing is there isn't a computer powerful enough on Earth right now to process that. So they're kind of reliant a bit on Moore's law yep. um, to catch up. So it's still in development. Um, but each one of these telescopes is capable of, well, the system is capable of detecting an airport radar at 30 light years. So it kind of gives you an idea years. of the sen yeah, sensitivity and on this is with, insane. With Moore's law, how far, how, how long are they expecting? For 2026, 2027, okay. hopefully. Yeah. I mean, we're falling behind uh, on Moore's law at the moment, I think, anyway. so Yeah, that's the thing. It's all moving towards quantum right, For people who aren't engineers, so. you're an engineer, Jules, so you know what that is. <laughs> I, what, what is Moore's law? That might be a silly so, question. So more devise this theory that every so many months computer processing power essentially would double. Oh, okay. Um, right. Yeah. So it was quite a neat like theory, but as you said, we're kind of we're surpassing that now. We're moving more into quantum computing. But wow. um, I mean the sensitivity, as I said, the problem with that level of sensitivity is that you've got to filter everything else out that makes a noise, like your mobile phone. You know, if you turn on a dishwasher in Perth, this thing will pick it up. Wow. It's, it's that sen it's that sensitive. It's insane. <laughs> Uh, it's based out of Jodrell Bank as the headquarters, global headquarters. Mm. Um, I spent a bit of time up there, uh, but did a lot of work kind of setting up all their online kind of websites and outreach and whatever. And I got, again, to be quite heavily involved with the science team. Um, prior to that, I was 16 years at Yamaha's research and development designing synthesizers um, and musical instruments. So uh, wow. two passions in my life have been music and astronomy, always have been. Um, to me, a, a synthesizer was just a computer that made noises. So much like Brian Cox, um, Brian May, and the various <laughs> other people, there's kind of this left brain, right brain thing going on, I guess. Mm. The bizarre one with Coxie, um, to know Brian a little bit, I've met, met with him a few times at events in uh, America, and we've talked on Twitter and what have you in the past. Um, his band, Dare, so I was with Ultravox. Um, some of the older listeners may remember them. Um, <laughs> Kind of big band in the 80s so i i was the uh engineer for ultravox uh, for cool. a while back in the early 90s and our guitarist was the guitarist that brian cox was with in his rock band dare and i got the job at yamaha research and development because their saxophone player in d ream who played on things can only get better was one of yamaha's sound design team um and i was asking all these really annoying physics questions about how certain synthesizers worked and he just went <laughs> you need to come and work for us uh, so i did and i spent 16 years designing and like testing and working on every synth that we did for the yamaha so um wow. yeah I mean, wow what a, was what a background so i'm different uh, you bit all over the place with very varied engineering projects and space projects well, what was your education to get up and start getting into some of this 
so first degree in astrophysics. Uh, then I ended up working in a music shop. Um, which was really quite interesting. It was kind of like, how do I pay back some of the student debt? Um, got a job <laughs> in the West End of London in a music, because I was really into synthesizers and I was in a kind of band as well at the time playing keyboards. Um, spent about two years doing that and that was how I got the job at Yamaha because I wasn't one of these, I'm just going to sell you something kind of people. I was really into the technology and trying to understand how the synthesis engines worked. Uh, and that kind of, I guess, just got around with some of the company reps that were coming in and like trying to flog us stuff and they'd be trying to flog me something and I'd say, well, how does it work? And what, what happens if you do this? And what happens if you do that? And they kind of went, okay, this guy's, you know. So I got headhunted by simultaneously two music companies, Korg and Yamaha, um, taken over to the Frankfurt Music Messer. Uh, this was back in about 1993 uh, by both companies. So one of them paid for my hotel, the other one paid for my flight. And they were, it was kind of whining and dining and uh, trying to get me to work for them. I just picked Yamaha because they were, they seemed like they were bigger and they were. Um, mm. A lot of fun. And then whilst I was at Yamaha, I did a master's degree in acoustics and digital signal processing, um, which kind of tied in a bit with obviously what I was doing there, but kind of reinvigorated my passion for astronomy with the signal processing side. So my wife said to me, if you graduate, if you get your master's degree, I'll buy you a telescope because that's all you talk about. Um, <laughs> So after graduation on the masters, um, she did, and it kind of escalated from there. And at the time, I had a recording studio. Uh, I sold the recording or most of the recording studio. I've got some of it back now, but most of it went and paid for some telescopes, computers, an observatory. So I built an observatory in my garden, um, remotely controlled observatory, and do that. And then. I kind of also, in parallel with the day jobs, um, was working for the Fox Telescope. So that's the big two-meter telescope project based. There's one in Hawaii at the top of uh, Mount Heliakala in Hawaii and another mm -hmm. one at Siding Springs. So I spent six years doing the pro -am, uh, program management for them. So coordinating like, what they were doing with amateurs with what the professionals wanted. Uh, we discovered about 20 odd asteroids, uh, which was quite cool. Got, I've got cool. to name, I'm going to be able to name some of them. We got one confirmed by the MPC only a few months ago. So that was out near the orbit of Jupiter, um, Jupiter Trojan, which is quite fun. Uh, we got a blue Peter, so I've got a blue Peter badge <laughs> on the back of that. That was a lot of, that's that one of my high points. So <laughs> it's one of my high points of my life. Um, so I did that. I've also done a lot of event organizing. So I've organized Apollo events in the UK. I did the big legends of Apollo event this year that suddenly got put back due to COVID. But last year I did with the National Space Center, the flight controller Apollo 50 event. I spent six years working for the Space Fest uh, team out in Arizona. So we did Space Fest like every year around about June, July. It was cancelled again this year due to COVID. Um, so on the back of that, I got to meet and become quite good friends with a lot of the Apollo astronauts. So Al Ward and I knew wow. really well. Um, cool. And yeah, I've got Buzz Aldrin's phone number on speed dial on my phone. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. Um, <laughs> most of them are genuinely really, I mean, Al was great. Al was just really an absolute gem to know charlie jute that um dick gordon al al bean mm. um gene cernan was my kind of hero because um i don't know if you guys knew but i was the person who was hunting for the apollo 10 lunar module snoopy oh. so uh set that up in about 2011 worked with some of the astrodynamics team who were on the laddie uh, mission to the moon um guy called mike laux who's absolutely amazing astrodynamics expert um we got loads of data sent it over to him um ended up working with chuck dietrich who was the retro officer on apollo and fred hayes wow. he got involved from apollo 13 um and we spent about seven or eight years looking for it and then last year we found it um we're pretty sure we found it uh, there's an object called 2018 av2 um and uh, basically, initially, it was thought to be an asteroid, but it's in the right orbit. It's the right size. It's not an asteroid. It's a man-made object. Um, everything fits. Um, and the teams at JPL say, yeah, we think this could be Snoopy. So it's currently, unfortunately, heading out 
back towards the sun because it's in a heliocentric orbit. So basically following an orbit around the sun comes back in 2037 into our neck of the woods because it's only four and a half meters wide. Um, so magnitude on that is currently about 29.7. So there's no telescope on Earth that can see it right mm. now. Um, it was visible a couple of years ago fleetingly for a few months and then it kind of went off again. Um, so I've been talking to the Artemis team um, at NASA because I've got really good friends who work at NASA Goddard and have been over to SSCO. I was one of the people who helped save the James Webb telescope when it was about to be cancelled by Congress. There was a team of us got together on that as well. Um, and they've basically said, look, if you can find the money, we can get you a ride share on Artemis 2 and basically launch you. Because we calculated the intercept vector was about 112 days from Artemis 2 during translunar injection mm -hmm. to get to where Snoopy would be at the time. And if we could do a flyby, uh, we could prove it. So wow. but it's going to cost, uh, it's, it's a lot of money. And to <laughs> me, it's it's more of a kind of... The scientific return is minimal, and I'm, I've always been yeah. about the science. So, yeah, there we go. Wow. Um, so, working in the science and the engineering space, I mean, it, it sort of exploded in the last few years as public interest has, has grown around, you know, things like Elon Musk aiming to set up colonies on Mars and people like Jeff Bezos investing a lot of money. What are some of the most exciting developments you're looking at in the next 10 years that you think, wow, people are going to be shocked by this? Um, I think Musk, there's a kind of love-hate relationship with most of the scientific and engineering community with Musk. In the one hand, what he's done with Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy is incredible. I mean, to see the twin Falcon Heavy cores landing in parallel on those pads, yeah, it was cool. like watching Thunderbirds. You know, if you grew up with Jerry Anderson and Thunderbirds, it <laughs> was one of those how. It's amazing. And, you know, the shuttle... I love the shuttle when it first started, you know, watching John Young and Bob Crippen launch on STS-1 as an 11 year old from school. And I nagged my headmaster, like myself from one other kid in school out of 600 of us were interested in watching the shuttle take off. And we nagged to, to watch this. And I love the shuttle at that point, but then the shuttle, sorry, my computer's beeping at me. The shuttle kind of turned into just a pizza delivery truck really i mean mm. the iss has never been something of of major interest to me um i'm more into proper exploration deep space exploration i mean the iss is great in that it's shown collaboration it's shown that we can build enormous structures in space but it's never what it was meant to be you know talk to and i know si lieber got really well who was ecom on apollo and he was involved in the original design on the space station as as it was the original space station and it was always really aimed as Werner von Braun's kind of in orbit assembly vehicle so we could get to Mars mm. so what I'm hoping for is that either SLS if it continues to run over budget who knows but SLS or Falcon Heavy is going to do a translunar Apollo 8 style mission in the next few years I think landing by 2024 is a big ask it you know who knows Mm. Never say never, but it's a big ask. Um, I think viably a uh, translunar kind of circumlun circumlunar mission is possible. Um, I was born the day that Apollo 12 was on the moon. Um, cool. So it was kind of, I missed it just, if you see what I mean. Um, I kind of Apollo 17 even was just a little bit beyond me. I remember Viking quite well and Voyager and what have you, but... Um, I'm hoping to see people land on the moon again. A woman landing on the moon, uh, yeah, multidisciplined, multinational team landing on the moon and doing some science again, great. I don't think we should be colonizing and or mining the moon just yet. There's still a ton of exploration to be done. We only scratched the surface during an Apollo, so we need to go back and do that. I'm hoping by mid 2030s we're going to be on Mars again. Um, more missions like Rosetta, fantastic. Huygens, absolutely fantastic. New Horizons. The robotic missions are great, but they're never going to have the same romanticism that Apollo had. I mean, Apollo yeah. changed, changed the world, literally changed the world. Um, in my opinion, and I've argued this many times, and please feel free to argue it with me, um, it's <laughs> the greatest technical achievement in human history. There's nothing surpassed it. Certainly, because, yeah. you know, if you think about, you've got the computing power of a Raspberry Pi, <laughs> basically, for the entirety of mission control. And then you've got the computing power of a, you know, a, a pocket watch, like a, a Garmin watch on the, on the spacecraft itself. 
Yeah. It, and it got us to the moon six times and back. Um, so when, you know, if you think the amount of computing power now just to take a selfie, um, or if you type in one sentence into Microsoft Word, you're eating up more memory than the entire Apollo. It's how, just how did terrifying. We, how did we do that? Um, That's just how, amazing, isn't it? It is incredible, yeah. Brilliant engineering. Just, just, just genuinely brilliant. I mean, Werner von Braun, you know, Nazi past aside, was a genius. He, uh, yeah. His entire team were absolute geniuses when it come, came to engineering. Draper Labs, what they did on the Apollo guidance computer, changed everything. You wouldn't have a phone in your pocket if it wasn't for the Apollo guidance computer because it transformed computing. It mm -hmm. gave us preemptive multitasking. It gave us virtual machines. It gave us, you know, proper coding, structured coding. Um, you know, test engineering, software engineering didn't exist before the Apollo guidance computer in the way that we know it now. So mm. that to me was one of the greatest achievements in history and Apollo itself. Until we land on Mars, we're never going to beat that. Mm. Certainly. You, know, you can talk about so many different things that we've done through human history, but, you know, using something with the thrust power of the entire, I mean, the energy coming out of the Saturn V at launch for the first 142 seconds is greater than the gigawatt output of the United Kingdom. Wow. At peak load. So how do you compete with that? There's nothing we've built since. The most powerful rocket ever launched is now 50 years old. The yeah. most powerful engines ever launched are now 65 years old. You know, the X-15 as well. We've never surpassed that. There's never been a human being flown in an aircraft as fast as an X-15. Yeah. That was the 1950s that was designed. <laughs> so it's kind of, you've got to look back to look forward. And I'm hoping that Musk takes lots of risks. And mm. that's what you need. He's kind of, he, he's not afraid. He blew up pad 39A. So what? He just carried on. <laughs> yeah. Whereas Jeff Bezos is far more measured. Um, and I like Bezos, although his spacecraft does look like something out of an Austin Powers movie. Um, <laughs> it does, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. It's like the Wang, as it were, from, <laughs> from the Austin Powers movies. Um, but he's taken a very measured approach, and you wish them both well. My, my hate side of Musk is Starlink. Because Starlink is a complete catastrophe when it comes to both what he's doing with the debris issue in low earth orbit i mean currently there's 136 million pieces of debris wow. in low medium and geo orbit um ranging from a few millimeters across or millimeter or so across up to the size of a bus does that cause Every issues when we launch things into space well yeah absolutely it's going mm. to at the moment there's about 3,000 active and inactive satellites in orbit musk at the rate musk is putting them up he's going to have 10 times that number within a few years mm. And then they've got a 5% failure rate. So when they do fail, and they will, um, or something goes wrong, you know, gravity, for all of its failings of a movie with Sandra Bullock and George Clooney, <laughs> it really <laughs> emphasised the scale of the problem yeah. in the same way that Deep Impact kind of woke everyone up to the threat of asteroids and cometary impact. You know, that, again, is something that we need to take seriously because one day we won't be so lucky. Hail Bob in 1997 was 35 kilometers wide had that hit the earth nothing would be alive no. we'd all be dead yeah and it only missed us by a month in terms of orbital positions relatively on a whatever 180 whatever thousand year orbit it was on so it's one of those things that we can control so much and david attenborough's done an amazing job in terms of highlighting plastic in the ocean and the the threat of that to humanity mm. um Somebody like Cox or Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye or somebody with a reasonably high profile really needs to shake the world and say, look up about 100 kilometers. That's a mess. And if that mess isn't fixed, it's not only the debris problem, it's the radio spectrum problem, it's the astronomy problem. You only have to look at the moment in terms of, you know, if you've got 35 starlings crossing your field of view, you know, I take images with a backyard telescope that can hit magnitude 21. And he's like, okay, well, we've hidden them now. You can't see them. Yeah, the general public can't see them because their eyes can only go to magnitude six and it's a logarithmic scale. So, you know, there's no way you're going to see something at magnitude eight, for example, in, in your average back garden. So if he, he's, his kind of rationale was, if I dim them to that level, nobody's mm. going to see them and nobody's going to care. But the astronomers do because mm. they're all having to deal with thousands of bloody satellites pardon my french crossing the field of view all the time mm. to the point where we can't detect yeah. comets asteroids and all the other things so yeah i've got a major love-hate relationship with musk okay. um i've 
Um, when I was at university for my undergraduate, I was very into nuclear power, and um, my actual thesis was on the difference between the different um, cooling reactors. Now, I was very for gas cooled reactors, and I thought that if my actual argument was uh, if we had invested gas into gas cooled reactors worldwide, they would actually be a lot further along in the uh, space program. Now, do you think that we actually need uh, a bit more of a breakthrough in nuclear or some other technology to actually achieve um, slightly further distance and travel to Mars or something like that? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the issue at the moment, you know, home and transfers, etc. The Mars, the average Mars transfer time is anywhere between seven and nine months. So you've got seven to nine months where you're in basically something. And if Lockheed Martin think that Orion's going to get a crew to Mars, they've got another thing coming. Um, thankfully, they don't. Um, I mean, you, could you imagine putting four people in something the size of a VW and putting them in it the, for the three The mental years? health impact the, would be huge, wouldn't it? You, you, they it, would go mad. It's not only that... The, yeah, and the radiation side. I mean, you, you're going to need something the size of Skylab, realistically. And that is on the plan, so that's good. So if you've got something the size of Skylab and you've got adequate radiation shielding, you've still got the issue of the psychology. And the fact that since 1972, the furthest we've been away from this planet is a distance from London to Dundee. That's as far... <laughs> we could drive to as far as we've been since 72 in a car in six and a half hours. Right? Wow. It's pathetic. So now we're talking about not 250,000 miles ish to the moon. We're talking about 30 to 40, whatever million miles to Mars. So the psychology, I think Andy Weir did a good job in terms of um, making people understand the, the sheer scale of the problems in terms of the psychology. Then you've got the fact that it isn't a walk in the park. The whole Mars One thing, which was an absolute scam, and how anyone didn't see that from day one, I don't know. But um, Mars One and all these things, oh, we're going to send a load of hippies to Mars. Great, fantastic. <laughs> when you get there, it's going to be as cold as Antarctica, miserable, and you're going to have, yeah, exactly, and nothing. I mean, it's going to be minus 60 on a good day. Um, so it's, it's just, and, but, but they have recently found explored. water or ice caps. Abs under absolutely, abs the yeah, absolutely. There's, there's potentially slush um, underneath the South Pole of Mars. And you know, I've got a project where we're looking at methane detection on Mars, um, looking at dispersing as a project called Median, which I'm working with in a team in Australia. Um, and it's kind of developing a penetrator concept. So you can drop things. This has been done in the defense sector for, for years and years. But you can drop things at very high velocities into the ground, and they work. So you can put sensors in them. So the idea is to put methane sensors around the rover's landing site to detect the highest concentration of methane and then say, right, rover needs to go in that direction because that's where the highest concentration is. And then prove if it's biological or non-biological. So exploration of Mars needs to happen. So if we can get a crew out there, yes. But if we can develop, you know, you go back to Orion and Freeman Dyson and, you know, the nuclear propulsion systems were being planned back mm. in the 60s. Those concepts were neat, but then you've got the whole issue of, right, we're exploding nuclear bombs here. <laughs> so how do we do that? Ion propulsion, yeah, there, there will be developments. There will be improved propulsion systems because if we get to Mars in six weeks rather than seven months, it makes it a really viable prospect. Yes. Um, it's not going to happen with Starship. It's not going to happen with Artemis. It's not going to happen with the SLS because they're just glorified version. I mean, Starship's a, a bigger version of a Saturn V um, in silver, which looks like a Tintin rocket at the best of, <laughs> best of times. But um, Artemis, you know, it's two sh glorified shuttle SRBs, again, with a kind of Apollo Saturn V central core. It's not going to improve matters if we want to go beyond Mars. If we do want to go beyond Mars, and that's the problem, you know, then you're going through the asteroid belt and you've got Jupiter and the radiation there and what have you. Nuclear propulsion, yes. I think nuclear energy in space to assist with the other environmental systems that are going to be needed and the power, it's kind of like you know, we need to go back to Three Mile Island and, you know, Chernobyl and what have you and say, okay, these were accidents. They happened. Okay. Yeah. They shouldn't have happened, but they happened. So we shouldn't get our pants in a twist over nuclear, the, the term nuclear. It's all the environmentalists go, oh, yeah. we can't do nuclear, know, we can't do nuclear. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's ridiculous. Yes. We can do nuclear, we just got to do it safely. Mm. And we've been barking on about fusion. it's safer than fusion. anything else at the moment. Absolutely. Honest. And you bark on about fusion since the 1940s, 1950s. Um, if we can crack that, 
That's even, coming together, isn't it? In in France, yeah. they're 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 working on that slowly, I guess. Yeah, even better. But these are engineering solutions, and the environmental movement needs to understand that coal is bad, yes. Oil is bad, yes. Chopping down trees is very bad, yes. But nuclear, if we can crack, you know, the whole issue with fusion and deuterium. We're looking at an almost infinite free power source that yes. has got a byproduct of water. Mm. So it's like the, the oil companies don't want us to be driving around in hydrogen cars or electric vehicles. You know, electric vehicles. Everyone's going, oh, EVs are the future. Well, they're not because where, where's the lithium going to come from? Mm. Where are we going to extract the lithium from? It's like there's, there's only so many lithium mines in the world. So, and that's harmful to the environment. And the I, amount of energy required to make a battery for an electric car is harmful to the environment. So, I guess certainly yeah. for for mine and, and Jules' generation, we've grown up watching you know lots of Star Wars, Star Trek, all you know all these CGI films where people are going out and exploring the the wider universe and and everything. And yeah. I always say to you, I think I've bored you enough times with this. I feel like I was born a bit too late to explore the Earth, but too soon to explore space. Um, <laughs> do, do you do you think? Uh, in your lifetime, you'll you'll see Mars possibly being colonised to some extent, or maybe even in Venus. I don't know about colonised. I think I think we'll see a crew on Mars by the mid twenty thirties, unless mm. Musk. I mean, this is this is the thing with Musk. You look at the SN five, SN six, SN eight development. The this pace that he is progressing with the testing of Starship is astonishing. Because he's like, okay, I blew one up. Right, now what? I'm going to build another one. I'm going to blow that one up. I'm going to build another one. He, he kind of, he's got the approach that NASA had in the early 60s in that we're just going to carry on. Now, what happened with NASA is it came and bit them in the proverbial in, you know, with the Apollo 1 fire. Yep. Because engineering disciplines were slipping to the point where it was dangerous. And this is the thing is that at the moment, if you're just blowing up fuel, pressurized fuel tanks, etc., nobody's going to really care. When somebody dies, like with Challenger or yes. Columbia, people will care. And this is the same issue with debris. At the moment, nobody cares if two satellites hit each other or if India launch an ASAT test or if China launch an ASAT test and blow up a satellite and several thousand pieces of debris go haywire. And that's exactly what happened with India last year, even though they denied it. Some of those pieces were at 2,200 kilometer altitude. The thing is, when somebody like, you know, Aston Kutch has booked himself, I believe, on a Virgin Galactic flight, that's great. And somebody at some point is going to go up on one of those flights and it may not be just suborbital Alan Shepard style, it may be an orbital flight. And if that spacecraft gets hit and gets knocked out of orbit and people, people are killed, what's going to happen then? Yeah. And to my mind, it shouldn't be, oh, suspend everything, stop everything. It, it's not like that anymore. You know, if a plane crashes, unless you're Boeing and you're lying about it and you're lying about your software, then why should you suspend all aircraft? You don't. If a plane crashes, you have an investigation, you go, okay, it's happened. If a car crashes, it's happened. You don't stop all cars. You just say it's happened. It's new or blah, blah, blah technology. Carry on. It seems to be this thing that space or oh, if anything bad happens in space, we have to stop for 10 years and think about it. It's like, no. We, yeah. we don't need to do that. If these astronauts are willing to put their lives on the line, this is the thing with the, with the Hubble. Um, when Sean O'Keefe, who was the NASA administrator at the time, said, we're going to cancel the Hubble servicing mission because it's too dangerous. The reaction from the astronauts and the people at Goddard was like, what? What are you, what are you on? We want to do this. We are willing well, they're, they're to They're modern day explorers, aren't they? they? They want to do these things. Yeah, it's yeah. it's you can't stifle people's desire to explore. If we hadn't had that desire, then Columbus wouldn't have rediscovered America in 1492 after the Vikings had already done it 400 years, 400 <laughs> years before. Um, <laughs> but but this is this is the thing. The, you look at the Vikings, you know, without barely a compass or any way of navigation, they managed to get from Scandinavia over to England, then England over to Iceland, then Iceland over to Greenland, Greenland to America, and in the human spirit to explore mm. and it is we've got to leave earth and there's no better way of infusing the public it's kind of like when we get to mars people are going to go wow that's amazing and then when we get to mars again hopefully will people people will still say that's amazing and it won't just be the nerdy space community who go this is incredible we need to do more of this i think it's you know, about the setting up an economy in space that that can make people money because i think big businesses will then be interested and more and more money will flood into it 
Oh, capitalization of space will happen. Commercialization yeah. of space will happen. Um, mining asteroids is the daftest thing I've heard in a long time at the moment. <laughs> really? I'm not saying in the future. In the future, viable. Yes. Right now, not viable. You, you know, ESA proved landing on a comet was complex enough. You only have to look at Hayabusa and the various other asteroid missions, Osiris Rex, how complex it is just to get a few grams of material from the surface of an asteroid right now. Mm. You know, you're talking about decades of planning, really complex missions. The orbital dynamics involved in that is astonishing, you know, because you're trying to orbit something that has almost no gravity. So it's, it's a level of complexity that's I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Maybe mm. in 50 years, asteroid mining would be great. But anyone who's back in asteroid mining right now, you're chucking your money away. Going back to the moon, however, where we've been there, we know that there's a, a massive resources there. And in terms of exploration resources and being able to develop regolith into 3D printing materials and extracting helium free and also there's things that we can get from the moon that are going to be valuable from an exploratory point of view. But asteroids right now mm, you know and that's a, that's a hilarious one you talk to people oh we're going to mine an asteroid it's got so much platinum on it yeah great so what you do is you go to your asteroid you mine half a ton of platinum you bring it back to earth at a cost of however many billion because that's how much it's going to cost to get the rockets to get the landing stations to get the, the between the research and development the, the mission time scales the manning the the crewing whatever if you're going to crew it um, the landing the stations on the asteroid the setting up the mining facility the doing the mining doing the extraction making sure that nothing you're bringing back to earth is going to cause any problems with contamination because lest we forget uh, there's a lot of um how should we put it? Um, potentially life-bearing things on asteroids. <laughs> um, we don't know. So you've got all that. You look at what planetary protection did with Apollo. Those, the first two crews were in isolation for 21 days. So if you do all that at a cost of however many billion, you bring back a load of platinum. What's going to happen to the platinum price on Earth? It's going yeah, to plummet. Yeah. yeah. So you flood the market. Makes, yeah, exactly. So your return on investment goes out the window. So, don't get me wrong. I think there's, there's potential, commercial potential in, in space. I mean, what Musk is doing is, is, is a commercial potential. It's the altruism that he claims, oh, I'm, I'm delivering internet to all these rural communities. Well, that's great. Yeah, but you're not. You're basically putting up a whole stinking mess and making radio telescopes almost impossible to use and optical telescopes almost impossible to use and exploration. <laughs> you don't care because it's just going to make you a few quid. But I think that there's propulsion systems. There's a lot that can be done that will make, you know, being able to get from London to Sydney in an hour and a half will change the world in the same yeah, way that absolutely. the Wright brothers changed the world 112 years ago, 117 years ago. It's they're the kind of breakthroughs that we need and reaction engines and Skylon and, you know, all of these things are going to be groundbreaking and, and amazing. But we need to really think about what we do because for the last 50 years, we've been chucking junk up into space. We haven't. Mm. And there's still stuff up there from the early 1960s that's yeah. dead. So, and I if mean, we carry on and we do get Kessler, if we do get gravity happening, we won't be launching a thing because we mm. won't have a launch slot. Mm. I mean, I could talk to you for hours about the future <laughs> of space and, and you know what we're doing, what's <laughs> going on. But, but so as, as a career um, for an astronomer, what sort of an average day like, what kind yeah. of tasks are involved in it? for you because you're a bit, doing other yeah you do well. you do a mix i can i can do i can do astronomy if you want. i mean the average day for astronomer from what i can see from my own experience is sitting in front of a laptop doing a lot of python coding so if you're <laughs> wanting a career in astronomy if you do yeah literally if you want to do astronomy pure astronomy and astrophysics um getting a background in coding understanding python definitely I heard somebody say they were still using Fortran the other day, and that terrified me. I was using Fortran <laughs> back in the late 80s, and it's like <laughs> terrifying language. Um, Fortran's really good. If you've got any kind of development experience, that's that's the language of choice right now for day trying to learn, uh, number crunching, you know, Earth observation stuff. That's all good, so definitely do go along that route. Um, if you think you're going to get lots of time on a tele, well, good luck. Um, you can put them, I used to get a lot of time on the Fox. So these things are the size of the Hubble. Um, 
and that was rare to get a lot of time on telescopes. Hubble, you know, you could be looking at once or two years unless you get to the director's discretionary um, to even get any time on it. If you wanted to do things like variable star observations or, you know, galactic rotation or quasars or black holes or whatever. Um, however, the sheer number of instruments that are available now is increasing and the ELT and the Large Synoptic Sky Telescope, there's, there's a load there. So, mm. Everyone thinks that looking at objects is all good. I mean, I was on Palomar with the Oxford Swift team when they were commissioning the Swift spectrograph. And that was fun. I was in the control room. You know, we were looking at Virgo cluster galaxies. We were getting data in live. Um, I mean, it, it's bizarre. They were doing flat fields on a star. I don't know if you know. Right. So flat fields is basically when you're trying to iron out all the um, dust and junk that's on your camera on your CCD. They okay. were literally defocusing a star on the <laughs> Alamar 200 inch to get a flat field so that you know most people use a, a t-shirt a white t-shirt and a lamp over the front <laughs> of the telescope these guys were using it was just astonishing it really was amazing to watch um so i think the romantic days of of telescopes and telescope time aren't gone but you know being in a telescope control room it's a lot of it is yeah you'll see your data coming in and then you spend the next three six twelve whatever years of your life i mean the rosetta team are going to be crunching that data forever they're going to be crunching magnetometer data and you know all sorts of different data that they've got they've only just recently discovered that um there's aurora on 67p on the comet uh, in the mm. far ultraviolet so it's a lot of code um from an engineering standpoint the sky's the limit it really is and you can you in my day no two days can be the same so you know we've got an office our company's got an office up at harwell um a satellite application carterport and the stuff we see going on up there they've got a small machine control center there where they're controlling some of the satellites that have been launched uk-based satellites that have been launched they've got the test and verification centers so if you wanted to get your cubesat tested take it up to harwell they'll put it on a shake and bake table they'll put it to minus 200 degrees plus 150 degrees they'll shake it until it falls apart um, so from an engineering standpoint if you've got a background in systems engineering from somewhere like cranfield or robotics from bristol or you know any one of those kind of universities that focus on that you're going to have a good a good footing in the engineering disciplines um, in my side is a mixture of coding testing um so i test systems quite a lot um but developing like i said radiation hardening based on materials that everybody thought isn't going to work but then i work with some really brilliant people and when you kind of sit around a table and kick, kick some heads and kick some ideas together um you come up with some really radical thinking that eventually turns into to something that everybody said isn't going to work and then three months later you go ha ha it does work um so it sounds of those great things. it sounds like you get a room full of you know scientists and, um, and and engineers and just come up with as many crazy ideas as you can we we can do i mean it's not every day some days it's testing stuff and making sure that software works as it should do but there'll be days when you're kind of thinking about radical ideas of how you're going to stop a hypersonic missile from hitting an aircraft carrier um your yeah it's 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 stuff like that you know russia and china um are developing hypersonic missiles which are traveling potentially up to mach 22 so if you're doing essentially however many kilometers i think it's about seven kilometers per second Jesus. these things are capable of doing in air and they're maneuverable and you've worked on um or that your company's worked on that's sitting in the middle of the pacific that's just a great big target what do you do? You know, you, you can't use anti-missile systems to stop something that in under half a second has moved the distance of central London. Um, <laughs> because there's nothing that on earth. So it's thinking of stuff like that. It's how do you stop that? How do you um, stop people from jamming um, GPS? You know, the, the key problem with the Kessler syndrome, if it does happen, is that you know, as George Clooney said in the film, half of North America just lost Facebook. Yeah, but they will. They'll lose Facebook. They'll lose Instagram. They'll lose telecommunications. All the defense forces around the world will lose GPS capability. Planes will, you know, what are planes going to do? If a ship is more than 15 miles off the coast of land, it relies on satcoms and GPS for anything at the moment. I mean, quantum radar and quantum technologies coming in that will enable them to get around and this is why these technologies have been developed because somebody can spoof gps so somebody could knock those satellites out so 
it's and it's from the defense side it's interesting but also yeah we do, we do oh, i'm trying to think of other projects i can tell you about but we did one which was kind of like an anti-piracy system so if you've seen the movie captain phillips and tom hanks it's kind yep. of a true story of what happened with the Maersk, uh, alabama so if you don't know commercial ships can't really carry weapons on board because then they're not a commercial ship as it were so but they can have water cannons so we kind of worked on ways of stopping pirate skiffs from atta attacking ships by shooting stuff at them that wasn't a weapon so imagine a giant condom being <laughs> fired off the side of a ship that basically inflates in the water turns gelatinous okay. and you fire it just in front of of the um of the pirate skiff that's coming towards you and it's dead it's dead in the water it can't move yeah. you're not killing anyone you're not harming any of the people on board that ship you're just stopping them dead in their tracks wow so it's it's fun ideas like that and you know what we're looking at at the moment is how we solve the debris problem because astro scale and all these other companies like Norfolk Grumman with the MEV and they said, oh yeah, we can send up a satellite and move one satellite into another orbit. That's great. What about the other 136 million pieces of debris? Mm. If you're going up on a one-to-one -one basis, it's a flawed methodology. Yeah. Because if you're having to send up one satellite to rescue one other satellite, what happens if that satellite that you send up goes wrong? What if you lose command and control? What if it blows up on the launch pad, on, you know, on uh, orbital insertion? There's a whole ton of problems with that one-to-one -one ratio that we're looking at, and I know other companies are looking at as well. And, and you know, one of the other things we, we do a lot of is VR work. So we designed, as I said, we designed the QEC aircraft carrier, you know, with several other companies. But on the back of that, we were asked by the Royal Navy to design the VR for it. So we've now built the QEC as a VR system. So you can walk around it before you've even gone near the ship and practice and train and learn how to get around that's, on a that's one of my yeah, um, big engineering uh that's one of the things i focus on actually quite a lot yeah digital twins it's predictive it's, digital twinning it's it's really interesting um it, it's very very cool but the issue you've then got with with that is like okay what can we do in space well you know, you look at the neutral buoyancy lab, for example, the astronauts love going in that because they can train to fix the ISS and they can, you know, float around. But you talk to them and they say, yeah, it's great, but I still know that I'm in a tank and I still know that there's divers near me because I can see that. So if you could develop a head up display inside their helmet yep. that can make them think they are not in Immerse a tank them. and put them on orbit in a photorealistic way but they're still touching real objects yes, and they're still yeah. moving real spanners then you've got that mixed mode reality that is going to generate something far and above what we've got now we, we did a, a demo with, so we worked with a company called Sysis who do a lot of software development for spacecraft so they did a lot of the orbital dynamic software for Rosetta and various other missions Mars Express and what have you really good company um, and they came to us and said, we love what you've done with VR. What can you do for, for us as a space thing? So we, we developed this. We took it to the UK Space Conference last year. Um, we did a demo of a mini version of a space station, which was designed where you could go on EVA and you could analyze satellites in orbit. So if a satellite had gone wrong, typically what you're looking at is a load of numbers. It's telemetry data coming down from a satellite in what's nothing more than a glorified spreadsheet in most respects it hasn't really changed much since apollo you know you're looking at numbers and data and graphs and red green and amber kind of traffic light signals uh, so we developed a system that took that but then you could go up to the satellite and then you could fault find on it from the digital twin while it was still in orbit using real world physics so you could say okay well it's overheated is it because of the sun angle is it because the solar panels aren't right is it because of this and literally pull the satellite apart down to component level as a digital twin that you could then analyze the problem so that was fun but the, the best bit was that because we're a naval company we thought we'll build a gangplank out of the space station <laughs> so it was, it was hilarious <laughs> to watch people because uh, so basically what we did, we put this space station about 500 miles above the Earth. So you walk out the gangplank and you're looking down at the Earth, 500 miles yeah. below you. 250 demos we did at the UK Space Conference. Three people managed to actually walk the gangplank. Really? We had people on their knees. Yeah. <laughs> literally in, and they're on a carpet in Newport, in a room <laughs> in Newport. But as far as their brain was concerned, no, I... they were about to jump off a, of a cliff. I, I totally agree. I, I uh, high speed rail, um, and I was in VR going through the station yeah. there. And 
I walked up to board the train, looked down and stood over the gap to mind the train to make sure I didn't <laughs> fall, fall between because I was just so immersed in there. Um, so what would be some of the big personality traits that yourself and you see in um, others around you to be in this role? Um, you've got to be methodical. You've got to be, I mean, the thing is with any form of engineering, you know, if you're working with warships, submarines, whatever, people's lives are on the line. If you get something wrong, people can die. Uh, and that's the kind of mantra that's stuck with me since, you know, the Apollo hanging out with the flight controllers, knowing these guys. And they said, yeah, literally, if we got something wrong, people were going to die. If they hadn't calculated the free return trajectory correctly between Jerry Bostick and Chuck Dietrich on, on Apollo 13, they would have died. Um, so it's that attention to detail, making sure that you haven't missed anything, making sure that you test, test, test. And this is the, the biggest problem I see with a lot of software developers is they're extremely good at coding, but testing your own code is always the worst thing you can ever do. <laughs> um, it's dog fooding. It's like, would you eat your own dog food? No. Um, write code, let somebody else test it. You need, it's like any scientific process. Independent peer review is what makes science good. Yeah. So if you're doing it in software, if you're doing it in any form of engineering, make sure that other people are cross-checking your work. And hopefully, yeah, it's having that attention to detail, uh, understanding the maths and the physics, obviously really, really important. This is kind of where I loved being in the music side as well, because to me, I'd look at a musical instrument and I'd be trying to work out how I would mathematically model how that oscillator on that analog synthesizer from the 1970s would work or how the human throat would work if I was trying to mimic somebody blowing into a trombone or you know, all of these kind of things. And that to me was, was interesting. Having good interpersonal skills in some aspects are really good. If you're meeting other people, very, very useful. Um, but then you've got the Alan Turing. I mean, I work with some people who are literally like Turing. <laughs> They're geniuses, but they, you wouldn't put them in front of a you know, 300 people audience and ask them yeah. to talk about what they were doing. You'd get them to kind of do all the amazing coding and then you'd put somebody in front of the audience to explain that, to translate that. And this was the thing when I was at Easter, I talking to a lot of the scientists and they were brilliant. They were real, you know, really smart people, but how to convey what they knew and what they understood in a way that the general public or that yeah. the average person would understand was a real interesting challenge and skill i would say so it's I think you, been you a, mentioned brian cox a couple of times and i think he is incredibly uh good yeah, at uh, he's doing a master that. at it yeah yeah he, he is a master at it um he really is he's like the thing but that's the thing with brian he's been used to being on a stage behind a keyboard poncing about with d-ring or <laughs> dare or whatever i love brian as i do you know he's he's that personality you look at a lot of the dallas campbell again i know dallas really well fantastic fantastic presenter and he knows the science and he loves the science he's really passionate about it mm. and that is what you need brian mays the same you know i've met brian a couple of times he's one of these people that he loves what he's doing he's more introvert he's not freddy but he loves, he loves the science. Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Nye, all these really phenomenal scientists. Um, Katie Mack, again, just brilliant. The, it's the passion. Susie Imber, I don't know if you've ever come across Susie Imber. She was on the Astronauts, um, What It Takes to Be an Astronaut TV show. She won it uh, the other year. Oh, yes. I, I didn't watch all of that, but I remember that, yes. A lot of yeah, them so, bailed out after having to take their own blood, I remember. Yeah, yeah. She She's amazing. I've, I've got to kind of know her in the last few weeks because of other events and stuff. And she's fantastic. She's a really good communicator and gets science across in a way that is really comprehensible to people. And that's what you need because the general public are very sceptical and afraid of science. You only have to look at what's happening with COVID now and the anti-vaxxers. And I saw I'm your tweet earlier about, um, about flat earthers and it cracked me up <laughs> <laughs> well it's like flat earth q and on all that guff yeah. is just you know the guy the, the best one and i shouldn't think disrespectful about people who've died but the guy who built his own steam rocket. powered rocket yeah. to prove that the earth wasn't flat that was a darwin award waiting to happen <laughs> it's like get a balloon mate you can just hire a hot air balloon and you'll get up to about 10 yeah. 20 30 thousand feet you'll see the curvature of the earth or you know, 20,000 quid, get yourself on a MIG. 
Yeah, get yourself in a MiG. Oh, well, I can't trust the Russians with a MiG. Well, if you can't trust the Russians with a MiG and you can't trust a hot air balloon, then building your own steam-powered rocket is not really going to solve this, is it? No. Um, I just can't believe the the denial. It's it's only since the YouTube kind of generation has kicked in. Yeah, think, that freedom why? of speech on the internet is uh, yeah, it's quite freedom incredible, of, isn't it? But it's guff. Yeah, it's, it's so depressing. It's like you only have to look at Mars, like a, in that tweet. There's Mars. It's rotating because it's a globe. Um, you can look at Jupiter. Jupiter rotates in ten hours. You yeah. can watch all the moons spinning around Jupiter. You can watch the Great Red Spot disappear. Where's it gone? <laughs> if it's not rotating, where's it gone? <laughs> moon, Question, questionable um, opinion points aside, <laughs> um, what are some of the biggest or one of the biggest positives uh, or opportunities you've taken out of your world of engineering and, and astronomy and, and, and science? Biggest opportunity to me is the value of being able to communicate what I do or what other people have done. So I am a big passionate kind of follower of the Apollo space program, getting to know these guys, especially the mission control team, um, and making sure that what they did isn't forgotten because yeah. it's going to the stage where, you know, you only have to look at World War One, and the last Tommy died a few years ago. And it's, are we going to remember this? And World War Two, you know, those people that were involved in World War Two are going to be dead in a few years. And then Apollo, you know, they're all in their 80s and 90s already. Charlie Duke's the youngest person to walk on the moon. He's 85. He was 85 like a couple of days ago. Wow. So it's, and you know, most of them are in the 90s. Jim Lovell, Buzz Aldrin, they're all in the 90s. So I would find it extremely depressing if the, the next time we go back to the moon, there isn't a single person who went to the moon still alive yeah. to tell the tale. And I just find that really, so yeah, between myself and, you know, I know Rick Armstrong, Neil Sun really well, and it's being able to, to take their stories and communicate them forward, pay it forward. You know, I've had the fortune of meeting some amazing people who've imparted their knowledge on me all through my life at university, undergraduate, master's degree, whatever. People who've really given me incredible experiences and information. And if I can look to other people in whatever discipline, you know, I work with some amazing engineers, like so people who designed aircraft carriers, they're, they're geniuses. Um, one of the first things we did was take apart their proposal for the submarine on Titan. Um, we heard about this Kraken, Titan Kraken submarine. We looked at it and we had our submarine engineers go, yeah, okay, well, fantastic spacecraft, but what are they expecting that to do as a submarine? Because it isn't going to work. And they literally tore it to shreds. And we sent the data back to the team at John Hopkins and wherever and said, you do know your submarine isn't going to work. Um, and they didn't reply. Um, <laughs> Shock. But hey, ho. Shock horror. Um, it's, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, being able to communicate ideas, being able to talk yeah. to, you know, really great people. Um, one of the greatest things in the last year um, during lockdown has been being able to share ideas in a way that we've never shared before. But also, uh, my company are very big in terms of hiring undergrads and graduates in terms of internships and placements and what have you. And one of the people I worked with, a female developer in the last year, she was absolutely amazing. Great interpersonal skills, great communication capability, but a brilliant engineer. And we learned, I mean, some of my team were all like in our 40s, 50s, whatever. And some of my team were learning so much from her because she was bringing something different. Yeah. And that's the thing is that people get very lost in their own very narrow sphere of what they do. And they don't look at the big picture. So that to me is the greatest thing you can do is that if, you, if you're researching variable stars or whatever you're doing, don't lose sight of the big picture. No, don't lose sight of the big science because the public at the moment, as I said, there's a major problem, you know, and that major problem could cost people's lives again. If you don't get your child vaccinated against measles because some nutter on YouTube has said, ooh, measles is bad. Like, great. You know, you're putting somebody's life at risk there. Don't yeah. do it. So that would be my big takeaway from from everything aspects and following on from that what would be some of your um least uh or less favorable aspects of the uh career and role of of career um, career industry both career industry i'd say industry when people get promoted to a point where they're not 
capable or competent to be in that position okay. because what then happens is you get people who think well they're they're the boss and they're going to tell you what to do and one of the great things like i said i spent 16 years at yamaha um we had what's called a matrix management system where one week well one month or one year i'd be managing a project another year it'd be someone else and it'd be someone i'd have managed and then they'd be managing me and it was fantastic because it elevated everyone based upon their skill and it elevated people to a position where nobody had any airs and graces we all worked as a team and that to me is is the biggest takeaway is don't try and think because you've got an extra grade or an extra star or an extra stripe or whatever okay in the military it's different you've got a you know you've got command and control uh, and, you, and you've got command systems in place where people's lives rely on people who can make good decisions but then you go back to world war one and kitchener and you know what was happening with world war one and the troops mm. complete mess you know they said oh go over the top you're going to be fine we're going to storm Gallipoli. yeah that worked out well mm. um so don't do it be, be, don't be afraid to recognize your own weaknesses and your own failings and to ask for help when you need it. So in terms of industry, that I would say is probably the worst one. And the other one is the nefarious nature of telling people things that you're doing and then them stealing them. Um, hence the patents. You know, I've got really heavily involved in securing patents on ideas because if you know we we will sue it's you know we're big enough as a company to we will sue people um if they try and breach this and we will name and shame them and that's one of the great things about the internet and social media and whatever is you can go very public very quickly with this you know people aren't afraid now to go public if something goes wrong so i'd say to any company um don't be a snark don't stab people in the back work with them you know we are very proud in that we work with anyone we're independent we've worked with everyone from bae systems airbus lockheed you know all the massive companies in the world and we're trusted because we don't steal ideas we work with them and the same with the little companies the little smes that are struggling to survive at the moment it's like if they've got a great idea yeah let's see how we can help them let's see if we can turn it into something that's viable mm. as a as a product uh, they may have a brilliant idea but can they commercialize it so so another thing we like to talk about on the podcast is a bit about um, sort of salary expectations. Now, it was quite hard to sort of pick a sort of a background of yours to sort of delve into, but we looked at uh, astronomy um, average incomes and we also looked at sort of engineering uh, yeah, sort of engineering. average incomes. Um, so for astronomy, you're looking between, uh, you know, 22 to upwards of uh, maybe 40,000 yeah. um, averagely. And then for the engineering side, you're looking between uh, 27. Uh, it can be up to, you know, 100,000, maybe higher. Yeah. Does that sort of sound right to you, those figures? So, sounds right. I mean, I, I'd recommend speaking to Heidi Team. And if you don't know Heidi, she was on um, the UK SEDS committee for a long time. She's just done an, actually a, a really good survey on this in terms okay. of the salary side of engineering and science um, yeah. as part of her, uh, as part of the kind of research project. She's at the Open University, really smart, uh, like Heidi a lot. Um, I would say it's, for some people it is about the money, for some people it's about the fun. And for 16 years at Yamaha, I used to get up every morning and think, I'm being paid to have fun. I'm being paid to to do stuff that I love, that I will I will use. And it's the same now. I get paid to get out of bed in the morning and to do things that I absolutely love. So the salary is important, don't get me wrong. And, you know, you've got to be, ideally, my, my first boss always said to me, be paid your age. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you'll, you'll understand. And it's true. If you can kind of keep track with that as you go through your career, then you're not going to go too far wrong. And if you can exceed that and go above it, fantastic. Um, but at the moment, the biggest problem at the moment, obviously, with COVID is that thousands and thousands of very, very highly qualified people are being laid off in the mm. aerospace industry in particular. So aerospace engineering is tough right now. I would say maritime engineering, however, we're hiring. I mean, we had 60 or 70 jobs on our website up until a few weeks ago, I think it's down to about 30 now, but because we filled loads of positions, we're hiring like crazy right now. So it's one of those things that I would say, um, look at it from all the different disciplines um, that you can, 
don't restrict yourself. I know people who've like got backgrounds in astrophysics that have gone on to work as engineers in completely different areas. Um, so look at yeah, it from I, a what are you what are you, what are you aiming to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I studied something totally different to what I'm in engineering now. I'm now in construction when I studied mechanical design. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so it's totally different. What would be something that's not in the job description that you have to deal with maybe day to day, or just something that pops up every now and then? Um, it's understanding the, the drop everything mentality. It's something that never really comes up in job descriptions, but happens. So you could be knee deep in project X and then project Y comes along and it's got a deadline that's imminent or somebody's gone ill. Um, so understanding, this is where I was saying about having a holistic view. I try and keep on top of what my colleagues are doing, that if at any point, if one of them is ill or decides they're going to quit or whatever, you can drop into that role. Not obviously to the level that they were at, but you've got some understanding of it. Yeah. So it's, it's being aware of things like that. Um, making sure that you stand your ground on what you want from the job. So if you want private medical care, if you want one, I mean, a lot of companies now do half hour lunch breaks. I would never work for a company that said you're going to have a half hour lunch break. If you expect me to pull 40 hours a week <laughs> and I'm sitting in an office, it's going to take me five, 10 minutes to kind of get out the door yep. and blah, 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 by the time. And then you've got 10 minutes to grab something, five minutes to eat it. And then you're back. At, no, not going to happen. Proper, you know, proper breaks, proper coffee breaks, you know, a, a good area where you can step away from your desk and you're not, sat there eating at lunch i it's one of my big bugbears somebody sitting at their desk eating their lunch uh, it's a big bugbear for me because it's like is it that important and covid has really hammered this home you know the oh you've got to be in the office no you don't nasa are launching missions to mars from home yeah they've wow. got people working at home i knew the guy who drove opportunity right he his story is amazing uh, we were in a bar in Pasadena. I was when I was over at Palomar. I was in a bar in Pasadena, um, just making some notes. Had a laptop and a couple of astronomy magazines, and I was sat at the bar. And this guy leans over, goes, "Hi, how are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, how are you?" And he goes, "Oh, my name's Steve." And blah blah blah. And we just got chatting. And about 20 minutes later, he was like, he was telling me his history, and he'd worked for a bank. Um, and, but because he knew these antiquated coding systems that banks were still using. This was what they were coding Voyager on. So he applied for a job, an anonymous job in the LA Times, wanted software engineer for blah, blah, blah. So he applied for it thinking, who the hell uses this? Phones up. Oh, hello, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he's like, <laughs> okay. So he gets in there and he's like, you guys are NASA. You're like, why the hell are you using this? And he goes, yeah, well, the problem is our, our computer is currently 500 million miles away and we can't change it. <laughs> so this was this was the thing and he got into that he ended up working on galileo all sorts of different missions then he quit um and he got basically steve squires headhunted him um because he quit and thought uh, you know the money wasn't good enough and steve squires basically said at a barbecue apparently um what would it take to get you back because this guy was really good and he said wow. well you offer me and steve squire says i'll give you the job of rover driver at that point he <laughs> pulls out his business card and it said mars rover driver on it. I'm like, and he was working from home that's brilliant so the whole can we work from home we i work for a multinational massive defense company and we all work from home yeah, i'm going to use that next time i go for a, if i go for a different job interview i'm going to use that the mars rover guy can work from home so i'm pretty sure i can work why from can't home. i yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. i mean like i said you only have to look at the recent you know work that's gone into the mars 2020 launch and a lot of the yeah. engineers are working from home you know you obviously you've got hands-on engineering that but that's the great thing about a class 10,000 clean room is that if you're going to catch covid it's not going to be in one of those yeah um because it's about as clean as you can possibly get and as decontaminated. It's almost like the Andromeda strain. If you've ever been in like one of these uh, ultra clean rooms, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have. So yes. It, yeah. I, I know. And it's mean. fab. It's just brilliant. Um, and it's, I look, you know, the whole bunny suit experience is fun. Um, and people say, oh, I can't wear a mask. Well, be an engineer working on a spacecraft because that's what you do most days. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, would you still go into the industry knowing all you know now? Yes, in a heart, I'd go into the music industry to an extent. I mean, the biggest problem I found with the music industry from an engineering point of view was, as I said, people above me not listening 
to what we were. We did a lot of horizon scanning, my, me and my team. And we were coming up with ideas that they said were never going to work, but then three years later, somebody would do it. Or we come up with ideas and they say, oh there's, oh, there's no market in that. There's no money in that. Right, okay. We were developing software synthesizers, which is the huge thing right now. Nobody really uses hardware so much. But we were doing that years before anyone else. And they were saying, oh, no, this is never going to be big. It's never going to take off. Um, yeah, they were wrong. Um, the great quote from my boss once was, guitarists will never use computers because they like pedals <laughs> and, and amplify. Really? Okay. Um, 70s changed that bit. It's it's very, very different. Um, so it's kind of, I would go into it again in the job that I'm in right now in a heartbeat. I When I was applying for this job, I had three other job offers from other companies and some of them were offering more money. It wasn't, wasn't about the money. It never was about the money. It was about what can are these people, what are they offering me and what can they, you know, what are they doing? If they can make the world's most complex ship, and it is the most complex thing that's ever set afloat i mean the whole deck on the qec has got to be able to take 16 f-35s landing vertically on it <laughs> so if you want to take a rocket off the deck of a ship that's yeah, that the down thrust from that number of 120 million pound aircraft is is quite astonishing um it's it's one of those things that you just you just love it you love watching what other people do um well, I, I could literally talk to you all day about space, engineering, you know, a bit of music. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Nick. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. And best of luck with whatever you do. Where can people right. find you on uh, social media? So at Nick Astronomer on uh, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Nick Howes at BMT. Um, you can find me there. Uh, Facebook at Nick Astronomer as well. So that's me. Thank you again so much. It's been brilliant talking to you. Yeah. Cheers, Nick. Thank you. Cheers. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.